All right, so we are just a few minutes past the hour. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, this workshop is study strategies for multiple choice tests. If you're looking for test taking strategies, so what you do when the test is in front of you, you should look for that video. It's going to be posted on social media outlets and on my TC as uh, my TCC as will this one. Uh, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with study strategies for multiple choice tests. So today's workshop objectives, we are going to identify different study strategies to help prepare you for a multiple choice test. We're going to demonstrate how cramming is detrimental to your performance on a multiple choice test. Uh, that means how cramming is harmful to how well you do on those tests. And then we're going to talk about constructing your own personal study schedule. So you have something physical and actionable to take with you from this workshop today. So if you watch the test taking workshop earlier, uh, you will recognize this pyramid here on the right. We're gonna talk about what is a multiple choice test. So a multiple choice test, you've probably taken so many of them in your school career, but they measure your ability to recognize the correct answer from other incorrect information or other incorrect choices. And most multiple choice questions uh, are just simply asking you to remember or recognize or recall some sort of information. You've got the pyramid over here on the right. This is called Bloom's Taxonomy. And you start from the bottom and work your way up to the top. It shows uh, lower level learning all the way up to higher level learning. And so, as I said, most multiple choice questions, not all, fall in the lower level learning category of remember. So with that being said, let's talk about those specific study strategies for a multiple choice test. So first things first, before you get started, before you choose any study strategy, you wanna ask yourself these questions. First, is the test cumulative, meaning that it's everything that you've learned in the class, or is it the last module only? So everything since the last test. You can probably look in your syllabus for this information. It's probably something that your professor has gone over in class. But if you do have any questions about it, either take a look in your syllabus or ask your professor about it so that you know the material that you need to prepare for. Is the test going to be open or closed book? So will you have notes to reference during the exam or do you go in with just the knowledge that you have in your mind? Is this just going to be purely a multiple choice test or are there gonna be other sorts of questions? Will there be, there be fill in the blank? Will there be an essay that you have to write? Are there gonna be short response, true or false? That's gonna, um, give you different study strategies depending on what sorts of questions are going to be asked on this test. Something else you wanna keep in mind uh, is how much time will you have to complete the test and how many questions are gonna be on that test so that you can space out your time and answer every single question on that test. So let's talk about notes. So all study strategies begin with your notes. They don't end with your notes, but they all begin with your notes. So step one is just to keep everything in one place. So you want to organize a folder, a notebook, a binder with all of your notes, any handouts that have been given out in class. If your professor has distributed a study guide, you, you want that in there. Any assignments or tests or essays that have been handed back to you, you want that all in one place. And you want to read through these notes at least once a week. So here we are a week out from finals. This week is the time to go ahead and to read over all of those notes. Refresh yourself on everything that you've learned, you know, depending on what is actually going to be on the test, whether it's cumulative or everything since the last test, that's going to tell you how far back you should go with reading your notes. Things that you really want to look for in your notes while you're studying for a multiple choice test are multi-step processes, any big concepts, 
main ideas, key terms or vocabulary words, look for events, groups, people, any of these things. But, but there are also other places you want to look and we'll, we'll get there in just a moment. Now, what if, you know, we've gone all semester and what happens if you don't have notes? Or maybe your notes aren't the best. Maybe you took notes, but you know, they're, they're so-so. Now is a great time to start. Of course, the best time to start taking notes is the first day of class, but the second best time is now, whenever that is. And so if you haven't taken notes all semester or you feel like you could take better notes, now's the time to go back to the textbook, go back to the readings, open up the PowerPoints if they're on Canvas, meet up with a friend virtually, um, and start taking notes. Uh, if your professor provides lectures online, don't write down every word that your professor says. Write down these big overarching concepts, themes that come up uh, lecture after lecture, chapter after chapter that have sort of spanned the course. Key terms, main ideas, especially things that the professor says, you know, this will be on the test or this is important, remember this. Those are all the things that you want to write down. But of course, note taking is sort of a skill and an art. So um, we're going to be hosting some note taking workshops as we head into the fall semester. So if you are interested in learning more about the best way to take notes so that you're ready to go at the beginning of the semester, uh, look out for those dates. We're going to be releasing those soon. So. I said we were going to get back to what you need to be paying attention to with notes. So um, those are processes and sequences, big concepts, main ideas, key terms and vocabulary words, events, groups, people, dates. Um, other, another way that you could sort of take notes right now or sort of refashion your notes, rewrite your notes, is trying out the Cornell method where you fold your paper not quite in half, but sort of a, a quarter of the paper on the left side, three quarters on the right side. You take your notes on the right side of the paper just as you would any other way. And then on the left side, you sort of write your own test questions based on the information you wrote on the, the right. Um, these can be cues, they can be different questions, uh, they could be things that your professor has already said are going to be on the test. So that way you're sort of building your own flashcards as you're writing your notes because then you can just fold your paper, read the question, and then the answer will just be on the other side of the paper. Something else that's great about the Cornell method of taking notes is that about the bottom quarter of your paper, you want to leave blank. And the reason for this is because this is your reflection area. This is where you can talk about uh, real life examples, any questions that you have. It's a great place to put all of those reflections, especially those questions that you might have, because now you can refer back to those questions as you talk to your professor. You can say, you know, I took these notes, this is what I gathered from the lecture, but these are the questions that I still have. You can keep those all in one place at the bottom of your page. Like I said, while study strategies do begin with your notes, they do not end with your notes. Simply reading through your notes is not a study strategy. And so it's always a good idea to pair reading your notes once a week with some other study strategy. And so let's go through a few of those study strategies right now. So the first are study guides. And in a lot of cases, study guides are distributed by your instructor. It might be on your Canvas site right now, but if your instructor has not provided a study guide for the test, you can always make your own. And the way that you can do that is by one, rewriting your notes as a study guide, sort of in a study guide structure. You can create a vocabulary section. You can order, organize that study guide by chapter titles. You can look at the headers in your textbook. If your Canvas modules have a title or name, then that might be a good way to organize your study guide or PowerPoint titles. Those are also a good one. Something else I also tell students all the time is that if you can, handwrite your study guides or handwrite your notes. You don't want to type. 
And the reason for that is because typing has become so automatic to many of us that we're, we don't even think as we type down the next word. Whereas handwriting, it's that physical activity of actually, um, you know, physically writing and seeing uh, that makes us pay more attention to it. And so just by paying more attention to it, it helps us to, of course, learn. And also, if you are a more visual learner, if you prefer to learn using visuals, I also encourage you to, in your study guides, to go ahead and include visuals, diagrams, drawings, illustrations, real life examples, anything that's going to help you to learn the material. The second method for uh, studying is flashcards. And this is sort of the tried and true method. It's a great way to memorize key terms. And now that we're in this online environment, there are a lot of different online flashcard options. So you don't necessarily have to go to the store and buy physical flashcards anymore. You can use a website. And on the next slide, I've got three different flashcard websites that you can use, but I encourage you to just every each module or each chapter you go in and you just add more flashcards so that you can always refer back to it. And that's great if you've got a cumulative final where throughout the semester you continuously add new terms, new themes, new main ideas, new information based on what you cover in the lecture so that at the end of the term as you're approaching the final, you've got everything there and you don't have to go through all of your notes again to create these flashcards. And then it's a good idea to um, quiz yourself at least once a week. As we're approaching finals, of course, at this point, quiz yourself more than once a week, but we'll talk more about, you know, how often you should be studying, what that study sh studying should look like in just a little bit. Like I said, there are quite a few online flashcard websites out there right now. Quizlet is the big one. Um, a lot of people use Quizlet and you can search on there as well. Sometimes you can find that someone who took the course previously has already created flashcards and that could be a good supplement to your own flashcards as well. But of course, don't rely on other people's flashcards because things obviously change from class to class. But there are two others, Brainscape and Study Blue, who also opt for online flashcard options. Like I said, there are many more out there, so definitely explore. You could just Google online flashcards and you should be able to find one that suits your needs. Another great study method is the self-test. So the way that you can do this is to brainstorm what is going to be on the test, write down your own multiple choice questions, and you know, come up with the answers. You can look at the headers, the subheaders in your textbooks, look at your key terms or vocabulary sections. If you've got previous copies of tests, go ahead and copy that style so that it's very similar to the way that your professor has previously structured the exams. And a great tip here is to go ahead and form an online study group with your classmates and have them all come up with questions. Say, you know, everyone come up with 10 questions and then come together as a study group, combine all of your questions. Say there are five people in the group, you've got 50 questions right there and then you can all go through them together. Even better is if you form that study group and everyone comes up with 10 questions, you've got 50 in total, say you set up a Zoom study group. Um, it could give you an opportunity to all go through your questions, provide the answer, and sort of become the teacher in a way. You can um, sort of present to your classmates the question, present the answer, and that's gonna help solidify not only the learning for yourself, but you're providing another method for your classmates to learn as well. Like I said, that self-test tip, form that online study group, combine all of your questions, and that is gonna be the ultimate self-test. I mean, the best one that you can get. Concept maps are another great study strategy. This is one that I use personally, um, not just in my schoolwork, but also when I create workshops like these. I create 
concept maps. It's a great way to visualize important information and make connections and show the relationships between different concepts and ideas in the class. And this is a really great way for visual learners to get involved with studying and with note taking. And it really can be used for any subject. I'm going to go ahead and show you a few examples of concept maps. I did not create these, but I did find them online, and I think they're a great example of how concept maps can be used for a variety of different subjects. Absolutely anything that you can think of can be created into one of these maps. So this one here is a concept map for math. It looks like we're talking about circles here. But you can see the big overarching concepts are in um, red rectangles. And then it looks like formulas are in the uh, black ovals. And then examples are in the black rectangles. But there are arrows showing different relationships. Each arrow has, um, has a, um, shows how the two shapes are connected. So for example, let's see. Up at the top, it says trig functions. This is the um, red rectangle on the right. At the top, it says trig functions. And then underneath is sine, co, sine, and tan. And then um, the arrow, down says, um, I believe it says identified as functions. So not only is it, um, you know, showing you the different information, but it's walking you through what the relationship between those two items are. Here's a, a simpler example, or at least this is much simpler for me personally. Um, this looks like a concept map for tennis. And so we see in the middle, there's the tennis rackets and the tennis balls. And then branching off from there are different principles. And what are those principles? Shots, scoring, surfaces, tournaments. And it just sort of branches off like a tree from there to learn different areas of one concept, which is tennis. Here's sort of what mine look like when I create a concept map for, say, a workshop. I found this one to be very similar to the ones that I create, but you can see all of the different connections, question from question to question, how they're related, what they're related to. Um, you know, I, I like that there are visuals in here as well, little illustrations that really helps bridge those connections between questions and ideas. All right, so now that we've gone over quite a few study strategies, let's talk about the timing of your studying or what that studying should look like. And we can't do that without talking about cramming. So what is cramming? So I know you all know, you've all been here. Um, you know that the final exam's coming up. You've heard your professor talk about it in class for weeks now. You know you'll get to it later maybe this weekend, you know, maybe not, you don't really have the time right now, but now it's the day before the final and you're feeling stressed out. You know that you have a lot to read, you know that there's still some things that aren't clicking with you that you have to learn, and you have a lot to study. But even though you're feeling anxious and stressed out, you really don't start studying until after dinner that night. But you know you've got this, I mean, you've done this before, you're fine. Then you spend the next seven hours studying to the best of your ability, reading this and that, uh, before you end up dozing off in your textbook at two in the morning, and then your alarm rings at 7 a.m. sharp. So cramming itself, it is last minute. So usually done the night before or morning of a test, although I would go as far as saying that it could be um, the weekend before a test or a couple of days before a test could be considered Cramming. And 
not just last minute, but cramming is also very unorganized and unplanned study time. So what I mean by that is you don't go in with a plan. You don't go in with expectations of what you're going to complete in that study session. And oftentimes you go in with what's called a hope for the best mentality. It's I'm gonna read this, I'm gonna read this, I'm gonna go over my notes here, I'm gonna look at the PowerPoint, I'm gonna watch the lecture, I'm gonna head back into the textbook, I'm gonna redo my notes, um, I'm gonna do some flashcards, and something's gotta stick, right? Something's gonna stick. stick. Um, so that's, that's cramming. For many students, they say that cramming has always worked for them, and I'd like to get away from that belief. Research has found that spacing out your studying is more effective than cramming about 90% of the time. However, students 72% of the time believe that cramming has been more beneficial to them in the past. So the question is, why is that? Why is there this disconnect between what we know helps our performance and how students feel when they cram? And I think that there could be many reasons for this. Uh, the first one is that we are probably more likely to remember all of the times that cramming has worked out for us than all of the times that we crammed and maybe we didn't do so well on the test. Another thing about this is that perhaps, you know, we got a B minus on the test. We crammed, we got a B minus on the test and we're fine with that. We're fine. We passed the test. We're good to go. But if you had really taken the time to study come up with a study schedule, come up with a study plan, implement some of these study strategies, maybe we could have gotten an A on that test. So did we do as well as we really could have done if we had put the effort in for it? Something else is that it's really difficult to admit to ourselves that we need to break a habit of procrastination. And it's, it's actually really hard to want to break a habit of procrastination because usually we procrastinate things that are um, difficult or boring or just things that we really don't want to do. And so why would we want to, you know, not procrastinate? I think that there are many reasons. Um, and I think that procrastination is inevitable for all of us, but there are certainly ways to overcome it. And there are certainly ways to make these unpleasant tasks more desirable. And then something else is that um, perhaps what you're doing when you're cramming is not necessarily learning itself. It's the ability for you to recognize what the right answer is and not necessarily be able to recall or learn what you've studied. And what I mean by that is sure, in the short term, you're able to recognize the right answer. But one week from now, if you were to take that same test, how well would you do? In some classes, what you learn in this class is really important when you go and take the next class. That's especially true in math and science classes. You have to take what you've learned in this semester and apply it next semester. But what happens if you never really learned in that first class? what you need to use in the second class. Now you're behind, now you've got to go back. You know, you're setting yourself up for this uh, longer term failure. And we want to get away from that. What we're truly after here is success in learning and not necessarily just success on one test. So with all of that being said, let's talk a little bit about learning and memory. So think of a multiple choice test as some sort of game of memorization and recall. So how do we memorize and how do we recall? This might look a little complicated, but I'm gonna go ahead and explain it to you. So think of um, a lecture or a PowerPoint. All of that information flows into our brain into our sensory memory. That means one of our five senses is able to detect that there is information coming into our mind. Now, if we don't pay attention to that, it's automatically forgotten. So if, it, if we sense it, but we don't pay attention to it, it's gone, okay? If we pay attention to it, 
that information can flow into something called our working memory. And that is where we can use the memories that we have. We've got two options at this point. Now, if we don't do anything with that information, if we just, you know, it, we, we pay attention to it, but then it doesn't really mean anything to us, we can just go ahead and forget it. But if we find that information meaningful, if we attach that information to previously learned knowledge or skills, if we know that this information is important and we give importance to that information, if we, for example, create a mnemonic device and make it memorable for us, these are all ways that we, something called encode that information and send it into our long-term memory. Now, what do you do once it's been encoded and sent into long-term memory? At this point, you can retrieve that information, sort of pull it back into your working memory so that you can use it again. But the way that it's gonna stick in your long-term memory is through something called rehearsal, and that's what studying is. It's continuously rehearsing that information so that it can stay in your long-term memory until you need to use it, and that's gonna be on a test. But what happens when you cram is that information is pulled into your working memory and it stops there. This leads to the information being forgotten. And what's really important is that encoding and the retrieval and the rehearsal, and that is what is called recall. Being able to bring something from your long-term memory into your working memory to be used for you to be successful in, in whatever it is that you're doing, in this case, a final exam. Something else that usually if you're cramming, you're probably not getting much sleep. And sleep is so important for your success, not just on final exams, but I would just stress sleep at any point during the semester. It's important for your academic success in general. So while you're sleeping, your body is not active, but your brain is super active in your sleep. This is where all of your learning and long-term memories are solidified and organized. They're established. This is time for your, your mind and your body to recover and to make sense of everything that you've encountered during the day. And these memories that are solidified and established can then be recalled for later use. Think of going through the day as, you know, your cup is full, but as you go through the day, um, you know, your cup empties. When you go to sleep, your cup refills so that you're able to prepare for the day ahead. All right, so what does quality studying look like? Let's talk about a study schedule. The first question is how often should you study? So I do understand that we are about a week out from finals. But what you want to do is something called distributed practice. And that's spacing out your studying over a longer period of time. And it's not too late now. Now is the perfect time to start. What you want to do is break your study sessions into smaller parts. This could be 15 to 20 minutes, and you want to do this at least twice a week. If you haven't been doing this previously, you might want to ramp that up to four or five times this week and into the weekend leading up to that final exam. A big study tip is that it's really not about how long you study, but more about the way that you use your study time. It is much better to get a quality, dedicated 15 to 20 minutes of study time than it is for you to go on some five hour study marathon. You wanna study smarter, not harder. And so you need to chop up your time by working on much smaller pieces and much smaller tasks. You wanna set a schedule that reflects your priorities as a student. So um, a study schedule of someone who really wants to get an A on their final is going to look different than someone who's all right with making a C on the exam. You really have to determine what is your priority, what do you want, and then have your schedule reflect that. I recommend writing down 
all of these smaller tasks on a piece of paper and then cross them off as you complete them. Just the physical act of crossing something off your to-do list can help motivate you. It shows you that you're actually accomplishing something and getting something done. And that, that makes us feel good and makes us want to continue. And then a big part of this. So I mentioned how 15 to 20 minutes of dedicated study time, uninterrupted study time is better than a marathon session, but that only works if you are focusing on one task at a time and not multitasking. And I mean, you know, TV isn't on, there are, you're free from distractions, your notifications are off on your phone, you're not listening to music, you're not hanging out with your friends or family. You truly want to dedicate 100% of your time, focus, and attention on that one task, whether that be a class, you know, a chapter of your notes, whatever the case may be. Just make sure that you're, you're focusing in and that you're removing distractions. This here is a sample of a study schedule that I've put together. Say I have two finals coming up next week. I've got AMH 2020 and I've got POS 1041. I've scheduled out 50, pretty much 15 to 20 to 30 minutes here or there throughout the week. When you put this all together, this is about three hours of study time for each class, which honestly is substantial. If you were to sit down and do three hours of studying for your history class, I, I bet that you, know, you probably get distracted at a point that you would feel like you put a lot of effort into that studying, but by the end of it, you may not be able to recall all of the information that you went over. Once again, 15 to 20 to 30 minutes of truly dedicated study time, it's gonna be much more beneficial to you and your learning in the long run, and it's gonna help you out not just on the test, but in using that information later down the line as well. Something else that I would suggest that you do is to monitor your study time as well. So after you're done studying, I want you to very quickly summarize whether this is to a classmate, so if you formed an online study group, if you have a friend or a family member that you can call up, explain to them what you've learned. Just very quickly summarize it. If you don't have anyone, you know, say it to yourself. You just want to end it on a high note. Recap really quickly what you learned. And something else you also want to ask yourself is, how did it go? How often do you do this? You know, you study and then you ask, you truly ask yourself, how did it go? Because at that point, you can make a decision, you can make a choice. Do you want to stick with this study method? Because you don't have to, you can change it up for next time. So really take that assessment every time you finish a study session, every time you finish a 15 minutes, just to sort of check in with yourself and see if it's working out. Because if you're not, you can change it. Right, so I wanna wish you the best of luck on finals this next week. If you want to form your own study schedule like the one we had a couple of slides prior, I do have a template for this for this calendar, and I would be more than happy to share that with you. If you have any questions about test taking or study strategies, or wanna go over your own study stra uh, strategy or schedule, please feel free to email me at desergas at tcc.fl.edu. And best of luck to you.